Ezekiel chapter 42 and I think chapter 43. I'm getting both of them worked into uh, one uh, presentation here. And that'll, that'll catch us up to uh, where we're at at the church. Uh, again, I apologize that, uh, for the difficulties that I've had setting all these things up at the church. And uh, maybe in the future that won't be such a problem. Again, let me also mention... Uh, this artwork that I'm using is not mine. It is uh, available on a website, www.bibliaprints.com. B-I-B-L-I-A-P-R-I-N-T-S dot com. Uh, lots of good information, lots of good artwork on this uh, on this website. Uh, apparently, it's been up for uh, quite some time, and uh, I have. Uh, I've used it extensively, uh, not only in my own research and my own uh, study and learning, but uh, also in presenting the scriptures with a uh, with an audio visual aid or at least a visual aid. Um, these scriptures in Ezekiel, uh, the description of the temples and the, the temple and the buildings and the courtyards and the things are kind of tedious to read, and and they're without much 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 study. They're 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 hard to understand, and uh, this artwork has really helped me a lot um, in understanding these chapters, and I hope it helps you to understand as well, and uh, I'm very appreciative to this website, but I don't want to, I don't want anybody, you know, mistakenly thinking this is mine, that, that I own this, I do not. It is a, it's a website available on the internet, bibliaprints.com, and Again, uh, many, many thanks and much gratitude to them <coughs> for uh, doing, uh, putting all this together and posting it for our enjoyment. Okay, uh, we're going to concentrate on, in this chapter 42, is going to concentrate mainly on these buildings here, the descriptions of these buildings on the outside. This is the, this is, again, this is the east gate, uh, the inner east gate, with the north and the south being here. Um, he's described we've made our way in through the east gate and described all of these gates uh, in, in detail, in very much detail. Um, we've, he's described these courtyards, these outer, the measurements on these outer courts, these passageways, streets, uh, pathways, courtyards, however you want to refer to them. Uh, the buildings, the singer's building, the priest's buildings, um, and the 30 buildings are on the outside out here. And now we're going to describe... These buildings, these buildings here that are adjacent to, this is the temple itself, and this is that large building on the west side behind the temple that um, it just, it, it, all, it, all it describes is the size. It doesn't give any indication whatsoever anywhere what this might be used for. Uh, anything you might read on the internet or see somebody else that is strictly conjecture and guesswork on their part because the only description we have of this building is the size. Nothing about the separation, the rooms, chambers on the inside doesn't detail anything. It may be one big, huge, wide open building. It doesn't. It doesn't say. These, now we're going to concentrate on. Uh, we went through the description inside and outside the temple, uh, the sanctuary here, the holy of holies within here, the thirty chambers, three stories high that go all around the outside of the temple. Now he's going to be describing in this in this uh, chapter 42 is pretty short. It's only 20 verses long, and mainly he's going to be describing this building here and these buildings here. So, starting in uh, verse one, then he brought me forth into the outer court or the outer court, the way toward the north, and he brought me into the chamber that was over against the separate place, which was before the building toward the north, before the length, before the length of 100 cubits was the north door and the breadth was 50 cubits. So he's saying this one building, 100 cubits, this is the outer building, 50 cubits. This is the entrance, one entrance in here to the north. There's one exit here, there's, there's, there's one door here to the inside of the temple on the north. 
each one of these. This is the entrance into that, into this small little inner courtyard. Uh, verse two, but uh, move on. This is in movie form, so I'm having to wait for this changes from one scene to the next. Verse three, over against the twenty cubits, which were for the inner court, and over against the pavement, which was for the outer court, was gallery against gallery in three stories. So these these galleries, he's calling them, are three stories high. They're larger on the bottom than they are on the top, and they're tiered as they go up, and they face each other. This one is 100 cubits long. This one is 50 cubits long. And again, they face each other. They're on the outside of the inner courtyard, or the inner pavement, or the inner paveway, however you want to refer to that from the, from the previous scripture. Verse 4, and before the chambers was a walk of ten cubits, breadth, ending, a way of one cubit, and their doors were toward the north. Now the upper chambers were shorter, for the galleries were higher than these, than the lower, and than the middlemost of the building, for they were in three stories, but had not pillars as the pillars of the courts. Therefore the building was straightened more than the lowest and the middlemost from the ground. So again, he's just describing that they're three stories high and they're tiered and they're smaller as they go up. Just like the tier work on the end, remember on the end on the outside of the, they were smaller at the bottom and larger at the top. And these are larger on the bottom and smaller at the top. These two are facing each other and the other two rooms are in, the other 30 rooms are enclosed, the other rooms are enclosed on the outside of the surrounding of the temple. <clears throat> Verse 7. And the wall that was without over against the chambers toward the outer court on the fore part of the chambers, the length was of 50 cubits. For the length of the chambers that were in the outer court was 50 cubits, and lo, before the temple were 100 cubits. And from under these chambers was the entry to the east side, as one goeth into them from the outer court. So again, he's describing 100 cubits here, 50 cubits here. There's a 50 cubit wall there. There's one entrance there. There's one entrance into the temple, into the rooms around the temple, on this wall here and on this wall here. Verse 10, the chambers were in the thickness of the wall of the court toward the east over against a separate place and over against the building. And the way before them was like the appearance of the chambers which were toward the north, as long as they and as broad as they. And all their goings out were both according to their fashions and according to their doors. And according to the doors of the chambers that were toward the south was a door in the head of the way even the way directly before the wall toward the east, as one entereth into them. Then he said unto me, The north chambers and the south chambers, which are before the separate place, they be holy chambers, where the priests that approach unto the Lord shall eat the most holy things. There shall they lay the most holy things, and the meat offering, and the sin offering, and the trespass offering, for the place is holy. When the priests enter in there, enter therein, then shall they not go out of the holy place into the outer court, but there they shall lay their garments wherein they minister, for they are holy, and shall put on other garments, and shall approach to those things which are for the people. So, in other words, the priests, these rooms are holy. They're for eating, and, and, and for, for, for the ordinance of the priests, they're for where they change clothes, because... The priests are not allowed to go outside among the people. They're not allowed to be seen in their holy garments and their holy raiments. Those holy raiments are, are strictly for the service inside the temple, the service to the Lord. Um, let me read a few scriptures in Leviticus chapter 6 that describes this. Verse 9 through 18. 
command Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. It is the burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night unto the morning, and of the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. And the priest shall put on his linen garment, and his linen breeches shall he put upon his flesh, and take up the ashes which the fire hath consumed with the burnt offering on the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar. And he shall put off his garments, and put on other garments, and carry forth the ashes without the camp unto a clean place. And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it, and shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood up, up on it every morning, and lay the burnt offering in order upon it, and he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offering. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar, it shall never go out. And this is the law of the meat offering. The sons of Aaron shall offer it before the Lord, before the altar, and he shall take of it his hand his handful of the flour and of the meat offering and of the oil thereof and all of the frankincense which is upon the meat offering and shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor even the memorial of it unto the Lord and the remainder thereof shall Aaron and his sons eat with unleavened bread shall it be eaten in the holy place in the court of the tabernacle of the congregation they shall eat it it shall not be taken with the le with leaven I have given it unto them for their portion of my offerings, made by fire. It is most holy, and is, as is the sin offering, and as the trespass offering. All the males among the children of Aaron shall eat of it. It shall be a statute forever in your generations concerning the offerings of the Lord, made by fire. Every one that toucheth them shall be holy. So these buildings, these things are set apart. They're set apart from, from here. They're, they're the places, um, as I mentioned, the kitchens are on the outside corners where these things are cooked. And they're all brought here. And the altar is going to be here before the temple. And the sacrifices are going to be brought up these steps, which were never before. and never had steps up to the altar. Matter of fact, the Bible tells you not to build steps up to it. But this altar demands steps be built from this way, facing east as they walk up, facing into the into the, I mean, facing west as they walk up. The face of the, the front door of the temple always faces east. But these buildings are set apart. They're set apart for the priests to change clothes, to keep their holy garments. They're not to walk outside these buildings with their holy garments on. And, and no one is allowed, apparently, in these buildings except the priests. And they're there for to eat, for to eat the sacrifices, for to eat the burnt offerings. They're holy rooms. These places are separate and they're holy separated from the rest of the temple area. Pretty amazing, huh? Verse 15. And when he had made an end of measuring the inner house, he brought me forth toward the gate, whose prospect is toward the east, and he measured it round about. So here we are. We're back. This is this is panned out. This view is panned out. Now this is the, this is the gate he's talking about. He brought me back to the east gate where this all started on the outside of these walls. And he measured it. And he measured the east side with a measuring reed, five hundred reeds, not five hundred cubits, five hundred reeds. Verse 17, he measured the north side 500 reeds with the measuring reed roundabout. He measured the south side 500 reeds with the measuring reed. And he turned about to the west side and he measured 500 reeds with the measuring reed. He measured it by the four sides. It had a wall roundabout 500 reeds long and 500 broad to make a separation between the sanctuary and the profane place. So these walls separate this temple complex that exists within here. 500 reeds. 500 reeds, according to the 18, to the, to the 21 inch cubit, the 18, the standard 18 inch cubit for the hand breadth would be 21 inches. 500 reeds, 5,250 feet. One mile is 5,280 feet. 
the walls that surround the outside of this temple are 30 feet short of one mile each direction. One mile. Now, if you know anything about Jerusalem, Temple Mount. I'll show you a pretty fascinating picture. This is an American football field. That's the size of an American football field. 100 yards, whatever they are wide. This is the tabernacle as compared to the size of a football field. This is the whole thing. The outside, this is the outer wall of the tabernacle. Everything that was torn down, that was ripped down and carried away. This was Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple was not that, not, not that much bigger than the tabernacle. It was set up in a little place. Herod expanded the temple mount to what the temple mount is today, which is somewhere between 35 and 37 acres. So compared to the American football field, this was the size of Herod's temple complex. This is the size of Ezekiel's temple complex. Look how much bigger this is than the tabernacle. How much bigger this is than Solomon's temple. How much bigger this is than Herod's temple that was Zerubbabel's that Herod tore down and rebuilt. This is the temple complex that we just read and described. And on the outside of this is the wall that we just described at the end of chapter 42 that's almost one mile on each side. With the separation from here to here with a huge place to separate the most holy sanctuaries from the profane. The profane being outside that wall of separation, which is almost one mile square as compared to an American football field. It's pretty amazing because all this won't even sit on. This, this whole entire temple complex right here will not even sit on what we know today as the Temple Mount. Here's a picture of the Temple Mount off of Google, off of Google Maps. We can, we can see this. We compare this to this. This is this is the Temple as we know it right now. It, 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 it's in Jerusalem. The, the, that's the Dome of the Rock. It's right there. And this place this is the only place that's cleared off. We've got trees. But this whole complex, this whole Temple Mount, what's known as the Temple Mount, what we know as the Whalen Wall or the Western Wall is this little tiny section right here. And the eastern gate to the Temple Mount will be right over here with the Mount of Olives being right here. And this is the Kidron Valley right here between them. But this little, this little area right here, that's what we know as, as, as the Western Wall or the Whalen Wall, the Praying Wall. When, when we see any, anytime you see a picture of Jerusalem, that has to do with something going on there. Nine times out of ten, it's going to be a picture of something going on at the Wailing Wall, at, at, at the Pram Wall. We're going to do this. Now, compare that to, this is a sketch of that, that same Temple Mount, the Dome of the Rock being in here. This uppermost, this is the longest side it has, which is 971 cubits. 971 cubits, not reeds. 971 cubits, 1,700 feet on one side. That's the longest. That's the longest side that's on there. The 980 feet here across the bottom. This will be where the city of David was in the old days. The city of David was down this way. This is the eastern side. The Whalen Wall on that picture I showed a while ago would be right in this area right here. The eastern gate would be right around in here somewhere. 1,620 feet on this side. 926 cubits. Not 926 reeds, 926 cubits. That 500 cubit by 500 cubit temple complex that, that holds the priest just barely will fit. Uh, it won't fit on this, this direction. It won't fit and it won't fit either way. It won't, it, won't, it won't fit into that. Much less that one square mile wall that goes around and separates it. So there's no way that this temple and this complex and this wall is going to sit in or around or be a part of what we know today as modern Jerusalem. It's just not going to fit. It's not going to be there. Now 
moving on as we can to chapter 43. chapter 43 we get into a description later on there's a description of the altar itself and chapter 43 describes the glory of God coming back to the temple returning to the temple the glory is coming home now let's go back and review here for just a second in Acts chapter 1 read some scripture about Jesus and when he left at the end, the end of his ministry and him and his disciples walked from Jerusalem out on to the to the Mount of Olives in Acts chapter 1 starting in verse 2 we read until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, You have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. When they had therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, would thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It's not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of of the earth and when he had spoken these things while they beheld he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up behold two men stood by them in white apparel which also said you men of Galilee why stand you gazing up into heaven this same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven <coughs> shall so come in like manner, manner as you have seen him go into heaven then they returned, then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. So Jesus, after his resurrection, had spent uh, several days with them. And on the day he was to leave earth, they all walked out from Jerusalem through the east gate, through the valley, onto the Mount of Olives, where he was taken up into the sky, into the clouds. And the Bible says that we'll see him coming in the clouds coming with clouds and great glory we'll see him coming in the clouds when he returns and they said they told him he's going to come back just exactly the way he left well again we see this repeated we see this repeated in in uh, in in the temple in Ezekiel chapter uh, Ezekiel chapter 10 let's read real quick <coughs> God speaking to Ezekiel from inside the temple from inside Jerusalem, I'm sorry, about the temple. Ezekiel chapter 10, verses 15 through 20, says, And the cherubims were lifted up. This is the living creature that I saw by the river of Chabar. And when the cherubims went, the wheels went by them. And when the cherubims lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the same wheels also turned not from beside them. When they stood, these stood. And when they were lifted up, these lifted up themselves also. <coughs> For the spirit of the living creature was in them. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off of the threshold of the house. It left the temple. The glory of God was sitting on the threshold, prepared, ready to leave. And it left from off of the threshold, and it stood over the cherubims. And the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. When they went out, the wheels also were beside them, and everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was over above them. This is the living creature that I saw <coughs> under the God of Israel by the river of Chavar, and I knew 
that they were the cherubims. Now look over in chapter 11 of Ezekiel, starting in verse 17. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered. And I will give you to the land of Israel. And they shall come thither, and they shall take away all the detestable things and all the abominations thereof from thence. And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. And I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. Excuse me. And do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. But as for them whose heart walketh after the heart of their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their way unto their own head, saith the Lord God. In verse 22, Then did the cherubims lift up their wings, and the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over above them. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city, and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city the Mount of Olives. Afterwards the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea to them of the captivity. So the vision that I had seen went up from me. The Spirit of God left the house and stood on the tabernacle and Ezekiel saw it picked up. The glory of God left that temple because that temple was to be destroyed. And Ezekiel saw that Spirit lift itself up and carry itself to the Mount of Olives. Just like Jesus gathered his 11 disciples that were left, and he took them on a little walk across the valley. They went through the east gate and went up onto the top of the Mount of Olives. And the glory of God sat there on the top of the Mount of Olives, and Ezekiel said he saw it picked up and taken away from off of that mountain. And those 11 disciples stood there, and they watched Jesus exit this earth. And he came, and he got on a cloud, and he rode into the sky. And they stood there moaning and, and mourning and feeling sorry for themselves. And the two men stood by and said, Look, this same Jesus that you saw leave here, he's going to come back again, just exactly the same way that he left here. The same way that God's Spirit left off of the threshold and went up and sat on the Mount of Olives, and Ezekiel said it went up. Now here in chapter 43, it's coming back. And one day in our future, Zechariah says, Jesus is going to come back to this earth. He's going to ride a cloud back down to this earth. And he says, everybody on the face of the earth is going to see him coming. They're going to know what's going on. They're going to know exactly what's happening. They're going to come, and Zechariah says he's going to touch his feet down on top of the Mount of Olives, just exactly like the two men said when he left, he was coming back. And he said that mountain is going to split in two, and it's going to form a valley. And the eastern gate of that wall is going to bust open, the one that's closed off today. And he's going to walk back through that eastern gate. Just like here in chapter 43, Ezekiel says he saw the glory of the Lord as it comes back. He knows it's the same thing that he saw left by the river Chibar. And he's lucky enough. He's, he's fortunate enough, he's blessed enough to have been chosen by God to see that happen and to see this happen when he comes back. And he's on his way, and he's about to enter. Back in chapter 43 of Ezekiel. Afterward he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like the noise of many waters. Again, I've said this before. When I hear that, I think of the time I was at Niagara Falls. And when you're standing on that deck or when you're standing in one of them hallways that lead out into, into where you can look at Niagara Falls, when you're standing there listening to that, you can't hear anything. You can't hear yourself think. You can't hear you clap your own hands in front of your face. You can't hear anything but that roaring water. And when I read that in the book of Revelation, I read it here and I read it in Revelation, and his voice was the sound of many waters. That's what I think of, that roar, that roar of Niagara Falls, that roar that's so loud you can't hear anything else. It's so loud that you're incapable of hearing anything outside of that water. And the earth shined with his glory. Ezekiel said the whole earth lit up. What did Jesus say I am? I am the light of the whole earth world. Verse 3, and it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision that I saw by the river Chabar. And I fell upon my face. 
just like he did the first time in Ezekiel chapter 1. The first time he saw the glory of the Lord and he described it. Some people say he's talking about an airplane. Some people say he's talking about a chariot. Some people say he's talking about a whole lot of things. But if you read it carefully, when Ezekiel's describing all that, what's he saying he saw? He saw the glory of the Lord God Almighty. That's what he saw. He saw fire. He saw light because God is light. There is no darkness in him. And that's what Ezekiel saw over and over and over again. He saw the color amber. He saw fire. He saw light. He saw the glory of the God of heaven and the glory of the God of earth. And here again, he sees it again in his latter days. He saw it 20 years before, and God has let him see it again. He saw it when it left many years before, and now he's letting him see it come home. He's letting him see it come to roost where he's going to be, and he's going to stay forever and ever. I love this artwork on this. They did, they did a good job. It's in movie form. And you have to see this. We saw it coming across the east gate. And it comes. And it settles back on the threshold of the house where he saw it leave from. And he moves in and he takes up residence in the temple that he's built for himself. Yes, he built it for himself. read you some more scripture from Zechariah chapter 6 I'll find it real quick I don't want to, I don't want to make this I don't want to make this one be an hour hour and a half long Zechariah chapter 6 starting in verse 11 then take silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Joshua or Yeshua. That word is Yeshua, Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. We know the man whose name is the branch to be Jesus Christ. He is Jesus. He is the man who is called the branch. We know, but behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place. And he shall build the temple of the Lord. The Bible says that Jesus is going to build his own temple when he comes back to this earth. This earth, this temple, this description of this temple complex that Zechariah saw in a vision. I mean that Ezekiel seeing in a vision. Zechariah saying that Jesus, the branch, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is going to build it himself. He's going to come back and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, verse 13, and he shall bear the glory. Nobody else can bear the glory. Nobody else can be the glory of God. The book of Revelation says that the angel flied around and was, was mourning because no one was worthy to open the seals. And out of the midst of the throne stepped forth the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. And he was worthy to pop the seals. He is the only one able to bear the glory. And he shall sit and rule upon his throne. Who has that throne been promised to? Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah. And he shall be a priest unto his throne. And, and the council of peace shall be between them both. And the crown shall be to Halem and to Tobijah and to Jedidiah and him, the son of Zephaniah, for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. And they that are far off shall come and build in the temple of the Lord. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me also unto you. And this shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. The Bible says that Jesus is going to come back to earth and he's going to build his own temple. Not only is he going to build his own temple, he's going to bear the glory of it because nobody else is worthy to bear the glory. And he's going to sit down on his own throne. He's going to sit on his own throne that he's going to build and he's going to make. This temple, this glory that we just saw in that little, in that little video come back with Jesus coming back. He's coming into the temple that he's going to build for himself. And he's going to sit and he's going to rule and he's going to reign from that temple. <clears throat> Moving on in verse 7. And he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne. I'm sorry, let's go back to verse 5. So the Spirit took me up and brought me to the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house, and the man stood by me, the man with the measuring reed. He's still there. He's still with him. Now he's listening to God speak. He's listening to Jesus speak out of his house, out of his temple. 
And he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor their kings by their whoredom, nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places. And in Isaiah 66, verse 1 and 2, it says, the Bible says that, 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 that God, that, that heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. The whole earth is his footstool. But in 1 Chronicles 28 and chapter, in verse 2, and also in Psalms 132 and 7, if you want to look them up and read them, it refers to the footstool, the Ark of the Covenant, as being the footstool. It says that we're going to come and we're going to worship at his footstool, at the Ark of the Covenant they're talking about. Verse 8, in their setting of their threshold by my thresholds, and their posts by my posts, and the wall between me and them, they have even defiled my holy name and by their abominations that they have committed, wherefore I have consumed them in mine anger. Now let them put away their whoredom and the carcasses of their kings far from me, and I will dwell in the midst of them forever. Verse 10, Thou son of man, show the house to the house of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities, and let them measure the pattern. Let them measure the pattern he's saying he's saying i've showed you all of these things i've told you to pay very close attention to what's going on and i've showed you these things and i've said show it to the house of israel and let them measure the pattern what exactly does he mean there by let them measure the pattern let's go to john chapter 5 real quick <clears throat> john chapter 5 jesus is talking about how he's received or better yet, how he's not received. In John chapter 5, starting in verse 33, he says, You sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth. But I received not testimony from man. But these things I say that you might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light. And you were willing for a season to receive his light. Talking about John the Baptist. But I have greater witness. Talking about himself. He says, I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, they bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. What happened on the day that John baptized Jesus? There was a voice that came out of the sky that says, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. God bore witness himself of his own Son, of, his, of Jesus, there in front of everybody on the day that he was baptized. And here in verse 37, Jesus is saying, My father even bore witness of me, and you still won't accept who I am. Verse 38, And ye have not heard his word abiding in you, for whom he has sent him you believe not, believeth not. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me <clears throat> that you might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe which received honor one of another, and seeketh not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe? my words now what is jesus saying here he's saying i'll come i said one man comes in his own name john came and he's telling about me and you would hear him for a while but then i showed up and when i showed up you didn't have the slightest idea who i was you spent all your life reading and moses and learning you spend all your time standing in the marketplaces praying you stand all your time being wanting to be seen of men for the things that you do and the things that you need and the things that you want you spend your entire lives studying and reading and knowing of the coming Messiah. And what happens when he shows up and he's standing here in your face? You refuse to believe that I am who I am. Why? Why would they refuse that? Because it's going to take away their way of life for one thing. There's, there's going to be one there greater that, that, that's greater than them. They're going to have to, the high priest is going to have to give up his special place. 
All these rabbis are going to have to give up their special place. All of a sudden, they're not going to be special anymore. They're not going to be walking around in town and being respected and loved for who they were because there's one there that's greater than them. That's the biggest reason that they didn't want to see. They didn't want to see. They didn't want to believe. They didn't want to understand. So Jesus is saying to them, you've measured the measure. You've seen the measure of it. You know it. You've read the scriptures. You know the prophets. You know the law. You know what's coming. But when I get here, you don't have the slightest idea who I am. And if you think you know who I am, then you utterly reject me. And what is Jesus saying? I'm not going to judge you. Moses is going to judge you. Because you learned and you lived by the law of Moses. And when you want to live by the law of Moses but don't recognize what Moses is saying to you, then you've done yourself no good. So back in Ezekiel here, in chapter 43 and verse 10, God's telling them, he says, he says, I've told them what I was going to do. In verse 8, he said, They have defiled my holy name by their abominations they have committed. Wherefore, I consumed them in my anger. I did that. They paid the price. Verse 9, Now let them put away their whoredom and their carcasses of their kings far from me, and I will dwell in the midst of them forever. That's a conditional promise right there. I'm going to dwell with them forever if they will get rid of everything except me. And in verse 10, he says, Thou son of man, show this house to the house of Israel. In other words, remember a while ago when he said, pay very close attention to everything that I'm going to tell you because I want you to show it to the house of Israel. Now he's saying, show it to the house of Israel that they may be ashamed of their iniquities. Show them and let them understand and let them measure the pattern. Jesus told us over and over again, he who has eyes to see, let him see, and he who has ears to hear, let him understand. Know and understand. Study. Search the scriptures. Study. See if you know what's going on. Know that you know what's being talked about. Don't be deceived. Don't let men lead you astray. Don't go outside the Bible. Don't go outside the Word. In other words, measure the pattern. And James says, don't just be a reader and a hearer of the Word. Be a doer also. Measure the pattern. See that it is what it says it is. Understand that it is saying what it is saying. And do it. Be a doer of the Word. Just like God is telling them right here. Let them measure the pattern. And if they will put all that stuff away from them, then I will be with them forever. Verse 11, And if they be ashamed of all that they have done, show them the form of the house, and the fashion thereof, and the goings out thereof, and the comings in thereof, and all the forms thereof, and all the ordinances, and all the forms, and all the laws thereof, and write it in their sight that they may keep the whole form and all the ordinances thereof, and to do them, this is the law of the house. In other words, God is saying, this is it. Show them everything that I've showed you. Explain to them everything that I've explained to them to you. Teach them everything that I've taught you. Write all this stuff down. Draw these patterns. Draw these pictures. Show it to them. Let them measure the pattern. Because, he said, verse 12, this is the law of the house. Upon the top of the mountain, the whole limit thereof round about shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the house. This is the way it's going to be, God said. These are my rules. They're my ordinances. They're, they're the way things are going to be. You're not going to bring these whoredoms back. You're not going to bring these idols back. You're not going to bring this, this false and fake witness and worship back to my house. This is the house that I built. Remember, Jesus built this house. He's, Zechariah said he's built this house with his own hands and he is not ever again going to let it be defiled. It's not going to be defiled ever again. This is it. This is the law of the house. This is the, this is the war to end all wars. However you want to put it. This is the last straw, he said. This is, this is it, the end of the line. Now he goes from there, he goes into describing the actual altar. <clears throat> and these are the measures of the altar. The altar sits outside of the... Uh, um, see if I find a picture that says a good picture of the altar.
So in verse 13, these are the measures of the altar after the cubits. The cubit is a cubit and a handbreadth. Even the bottom shall be a cubit. That's the bottom. You got this first row. You got what what this calls a, a, the settle. These calls a settle. It's a, it's a lip. It's a, it's a ledge that goes around this bottom one. And there's another settle that goes about this third tier. And it's describing these things at the bottom. This word bottom here, by the way. I kind of stumbled on this by accident. This word bottom is uh, it's Hebrew. It's H2436 in Strong's Concordance, and it's K-H-A-K-E, pronounced cake. And it's in the Bible. It's in the Old Testament 37 times. But only three times is it translated as the word bottom, and all three times are here in these verses in Ezekiel, uh, in, in Ezekiel chapter 43. Every other translation of this word cake is bosom. Uh, that's just that's just free information. I don't know what you can do with that. I don't know what that means. I don't know. I don't know. But but but, but what, what the word that's used to describe the base, the very bottom of the altar that's going to be outside of Jesus's temple, is 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 uh, mo most oftentimes known as the word bosom, the fa the foundation. The cube. Uh, on in chapter 13 and the breadth of cubit and the border thereof by the edge thereof round about shall be a span and this shall be the higher place of the altar verse 14 and from the bottom from the bottom upon the ground even to the lower settle or ledge shall be two cubits and the breadth one cubit and from the lesser saddle or ledge even to the greater saddle shall be four cubits and the breadth one cubit. So the altar shall be four cubits, and from the altar and upward shall be four cubits. So what he's described so far is this is a cubit, and this ledge is a handbreadth that goes all the way around. Then we've got two cubits, and the first one is four, and it's got a saddle or a ledge that goes all the way around it. That's a handbreadth high and wide, and then the top of the main altar is four cubits this way. And it's going to go on and describe it as 12 this way and 12 that way. So the main part of the altar, and he describes the steps that are coming up here. From this side, as they climb the steps, they're going to be facing into the doors. In, they're going to be facing through the doors. Now, before, in the first temple and in, in, uh, in the second temple, I don't know about Solomon's temple, but in, in the second temple, which is known as Herod's temple, there was a ramp on this side of the altar that they could use to walk up the ramp. Now, the scripture in Exodus 20 says that where, where anywhere you build an altar to do sacrifices unto me, do not build steps up to it because if you build steps up to it and go up onto the altar, then the shame of your nakedness is going to be exposed. That was in Exodus chapter 20. I used to use that verse to, for, for my kids wanting to wear short shorts and, and short skirts. I said, the Bible says, that, you know, you build an altar, you don't build steps onto it because the shame of your nakedness will be exposed. Said, then people wore robes all the way to their ankles. And I said, the altar was about... Most of them was about three feet high. And I said, how much of your nakedness is going to be exposed if you're in a floor-length robe standing on top of a three-foot altar? Your ankles. I said, the Bible calls your ankles the shame of your nakedness, and you're wanting to go out in public with short pants and short skirts on. That's just another little free story that, 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 that I, I use that against them. But, but the, Bible, the Bible forbids steps to be built up to the altar. So this top part there, we got one cubit, two cubits, four, and four. And the two settles or the ledges is around the bottom of the base or the bosom of the altar. And these are uh, 
this is on the on the second level, the actual walking where you can actually walk around, walk up to the altar. And the horns again it describes the horns in verse fifteen, and upward shall be the four horns. And the altar, verse 16, and the altar shall be 12 cubits long and 12 broad, square, and the four squares thereof. And the saddle, or the border, and the saddle shall be 14 cubits long and 14 broad, and the four squares thereof. And the border about it shall be a half a cubit, and the bottom thereof shall be a cubit about. And his stairs shall look towards the east. Now what he's saying is that this is 12 cubits square, this top part. So we got a cubit here that says these, these, these boards are 14 because you got a cubit ledge on each side of this upper altar and then you've got this settle or this ledge that goes all around and so the, the settle is 14 cubits in length on this way and on that way. And the steps go up toward the east. In other words, you're climbing up towards your climb, climb it that, that way. The idea being that, that uh, two things. Number one, when you're climbing these steps onto the altar, you've got your back to the sun. Because in, if you remember in Ezekiel chapter 8, we studied all the abominations of the temple. Um, as he went through, God took Ezekiel all through the temple, in the outer chambers and the inner chambers. And he said, uh, let me come and show you this abomination. And he said, let me show you a worse abomination. And then he went and showed him the women who were inside crying for Tammuz. And he said, let me show you the worst abomination of all. And he took him out on the outside porch. Because to, to God's way of thinking, this was the worst thing that was going on, the worst defilement of his temple. And out on the porch of his, of his, of his temple were, I think it said there were 24 uh, priests. And they were all standing with their backs to the temple facing the rising sun. Because that's sun worship. That's sun worship. That's, that, that was found in chapter 8. We went through that. And he said, that's the most abominable thing of all. So, two things here. When they climb these steps in the morning, they're going to be facing the temple. And their backs are going to be facing the morning and the, set, the morning sun as it rises. Also, because this is done for their shame, because these sacrifices are done, just like the sacrifices of old were done as a memorial and pointing toward the coming Messiah, the coming Christ, the one that we know is the Son of God, Jesus Christ, that walked there. All those were memorials and they pointed towards him. These are memorials in the same fashion as they're going to look back at him. And they're going to have to do these things for their shame. It says they're going to make these sacrifices. And Ezekiel says and Isaiah says they're going to loathe themselves. They're going to hate themselves as they do these things. Because these are memorials of a, th of a, of a man, of the priest of the king and the priest that they rejected and they slew. Because it says in the book of Zechariah, when they have their eyes open, Paul talks about in, in Romans that they're, that, that they're thinking that their eyes are blinded in part. They're blinded in part, which means that they still have access to the throne. They can be saved, but they have to really work at it. They have to really try at it because they're blinded in part as a nation. Because they rejected the Messiah. They rejected their king. They rejected the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So when they're making these sacrifices in the thousand year millennium, when they're climbing these steps, remember they're facing the temple. And these doors are going to be open. The doors are, oh, the temple are open every morning. And they're going to look directly into the temple. And they're going to be able to look directly into the throne room where Jesus Christ is going to be sitting. And they're going to have to walk up these steps carrying these dead slaughtered animals. And they're going to have to make these sacrifices to Jesus while they look him in the eye for a thousand years. They're going to have to do this because they loathe themselves for rejecting him in the first place. So these steps go up from that way so that they'll face the inner of the temple. <clears throat> Verse 18. And he said unto me, Son of man, Thus saith the Lord God, These are the ordinances of the altar in the day when they shall make it to offer burnt offerings thereon, and to sprinkle blood thereon. And thou shalt give to the priests the Levites that be of the seed. Now we got we got eighteen through verse twenty seven. 
So we got nine verses of scripture here that describe the ordinances, and that's pretty much it. That's pretty much the ordinances now. Um, I'm not going to take the time on this tape to go and read it. I strongly encourage you to go to Exodus chapter 29 and read the entire chapter. And you will be able to see, comparing Exodus 29, which are the ordinances that Moses gave to Aaron and the priests of, of, of the things that were to be done every day and for the consecrating for the seven day period, consecrating the altar and the, the, the sacrifice and things that were done all the time. And compare that, Exodus chapter 29, compare that directly to these few verses here that lay down the ordinances that Ezekiel is talking about. And you will see the vast, vast difference and, and the very, very simple simplifying of the ordinances that are to be done. In verse 19, Thou shalt give to the priests the Levites that be of the seed of Zadok. Again, these are the, these are the sons of Zadok, not, not the Levites. Which approach unto me to minister unto me, saith the Lord God, a young bullock for a sin offering. Thou shalt take the blood and put it on the four horns of it and the corners of the saddle and upon the border round about. Thou shalt thou cleanse and purge it. Thou shalt take the bullock also of the sin offering and he, that burnt, and he shall burn it in the appointed place of the house without the sanctuary. And in the second day thou shalt offer a kid of the goats without blemish for a sin offering and they shall cleanse the altar as they did cleanse it with the bullock. When thou hast made an end of cleansing it, thou shalt offer a young bullock without blemish, and a ram out of the flock without blemish. And thou shalt offer them before the Lord, and the priests shall cast salt upon them, and they shall offer them up for a burnt offering unto the Lord. Seven days shalt thou prepare every day a goat for a sin offering. They shall also prepare a young bullock and a ram out of the flock without blemish. Seven days shall they purge the altar and purify it, and they shall consecrate themselves. And in verse 27, and when these days are expired, it shall be that upon the eighth day and so forward, the priests shall make your burnt offerings upon the altar and your peace offerings, and I will accept you, saith the Lord God. Verse 27 again. When these days are expired, upon the eighth day and so forward. For how long? Forever. When these sacrifices, when these, when these things were set up under Moses and Aaron and the Levites, <clears throat> Each one of these were explained and they were laid out in detail and every single one of them said these will be an ordinance for you and for your children forever. It will never stop. And so far there's been a breach from 70 AD until now. <clears throat> there's been a breach in the sacrifices. There's been no temple. There's been nowhere to make a sacrifice. The, the Jews of today can't even go up. They can go up on the Temple Mount, but they have to be watched every single second that they're up there. Every Jew that goes up on the Temple Mount today has a member of the walk. The police, it's, a, it's a police force. As they have to go with them. And the purpose of these policemen, the purpose that these men serve while they walk around on the Temple Mount is to watch their mouth. They have to look at their lips all the time. And if they see their lips moving, if they see a Jew's lips moving, on the Temple Mount, they can be arrested and put in jail because their lips are moving, because they're not allowed to pray on their own Temple Mount. It's been that way ever since 70 A.D. when it, when it was torn down. And for 40 years, for almost 40 years, after the Temple was between the death and the, re and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and, and when the Temple was torn down in 70 A.D., Many, many of the ordinances, the, 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 the yearly sacrifice, the daily sacrifice, many of those things that changed, many of those things that, that had happened all those years with the scapegoat and the sacrificial goat every year at Yom Kippur, many of those things were different and changed because it wouldn't be recognized by God. The temple doors would never stay locked and shut overnight anymore after that happened. After Jesus died and resurrected, never again would the lamp burn. It would always run out of oil. The fire would not, the, 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 the menorah wouldn't always burn. The temple doors wouldn't stay locked anymore overnight. The scapegoat had to leave out, but the string, the red string that, was, that, the, 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 that the goat was tied to the temple door with never again turned from scarlet to the color white. You have to go into the, into the Talmud to read about these things. All those things changed, and in 70 AD, the temple went away. And from that time until now, they've had no way to sacrifice. They can't even go up on their... They can't even go up on their Temple Mountain and pray, much less make sacrifices. But they're ready, and it's coming. 
Daniel says there's coming a peace treaty. I don't know what that peace treaty is going to be or who's going to represent it, but it's coming. It's, it's not, and it's not long in our future. Jesus Christ is on his way back to this earth. And he's not coming this time as a lamb for slaughter. This time he's coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's coming to, to wreak havoc on his enemies. He's coming to set up the book of Revelation. It says, Behold, now the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of Christ. And we read in Zechariah where he's going to build this temple. He's going to set up shop in this temple. And he's going to be there. And all the nations of the earth are going to send representatives to Jerusalem to be there, to, to, to hear. Because it says the law is going to go forth out of Zion, out of Jerusalem, out of the midst. God said in, in Isaiah, I will set my glory in the midst of Jerusalem. That's what's happening. That's what's going on here. And this temple we read in Zechariah that he will build for his own. That's uh, the end of chapter 43, and that catches us up. And uh, I will try. I will try my best not to get uh, this far behind again. Thank you very much for watching.